Hi everybody, I'm Jim Skelly, and this is the sixth of our mini lectures for the spring semester in 2012 in the Global Conversation. Uh, it's good to be with you again uh, this evening. Um, there's a great deal going on and some things that I want to mention to you. Most importantly, I sound like an old grumpy guy here, <laughs> most importantly, would you please become active in the learning circles. There hasn't been as much activity as we normally expect at this time in the semester, and we really need you to engage. Um, what often happens, I have to admit, is that people sort of wait for somebody else to take the initiative and define the project. The proposals for the projects are due this coming Thursday, the 8th of March. So we need you to please define your project. Uh, and, you know, somebody needs to take initiative. Um, let that person be you. Uh, it's okay to take initiative. Don't wait for somebody else. Send out a note and start working, okay? Um, if you need to look at the guidelines for the learning circles, you'll find them on the course homepage near the top left-hand side, okay? And you know, there are so many different issues that you could be engaging with. And, and I was thinking about some of the things I wanted to report to you tonight. All of these things could be issues that you actually use as central to the construction of your Learning Circle project. So please don't hesitate to, to take a, be creative, engage with things, okay? Um, we. One of the things I always tell people is that this isn't a traditional class. We use the term collaborative learning. What that means is that you're teaching each other. So we can set up a very rich, in my opinion, course, but in many ways the real engagement, the real learning occurs when you work with each other. That's what we need, and we need it not only in this classroom, obviously, but we need it throughout the world. And this is a good way to learn what to do, okay? So if anybody has any questions, our, our, our gang of teaching assistants, and Sadie, who's the assistant course coordinator, uh, and myself are, are, are always willing to help you. We, um, we're <laughs> we have to... Uh, find somebody to help out and fill in for Jenna because she is, as you know from my last posting, uh, rather engaged fully with her newborn baby. So I hope you're moving along through the, uh, through the course. And speaking of babies, uh, around this time you should be starting to look at population issues on, the, on our planet. So please um, take a look especially at um, the videos that we've posted on how many people this planet can handle. This is a BBC production. It's split up on the website into about six different portions. Um, so take a look at those. I, I think it's one of the most stunning uh, uh, videos that we have uh, in the course. So please do take a look at that. There's a couple of other things I, I wanted to um, bring your attention to. Um, there was an article um, a couple of days ago in the Guardian newspaper that I wanted to bring to your attention. And it has to do with the increasing uh, problem of obesity. Um, and it's clearly tied to the consumption of sugar and fats. Mm -hmm. Uh, the global consumption of sugar has tripled in the last 50 years uh, per, per capita, and it is now a pandemic and an extraordinary problem for people's health. Let me give you uh, some statistics, just so you understand what's going on. Um, of course, you can all guess which country has the greatest percentage of people who are obese. Nearly one-third of the population of the United States, close to 100 million people, are clinically obese. The next 
of course, given that we have U.S. students here, I, I hope all of you are paying attention to that. Uh, and the next, of course, is Mexico. And the next, the United Kingdom, all places where we have students studying in this course. Um, the, so 30.6% of Americans are clinically obese, whereas in Japan, 3.2%. And it is clearly tied to sugars and fat. Right now, and this brings me back to something I really want to make clear to you. Early on in the class, we ask you to read a few pages from a book by the sociologist C. Wright Mills. And what he did was to make the distinction between private troubles and public issues. So he talks about one person being unemployed out of 500 or 1,000. Then you can look to the character of the person, right? But if half of the population are unemployed, you need to look to social structure, right? When one person is obese out of 1,000, you can look to their personal character. Maybe they just can't, you know, they have some sort of flaw or bio biological, psychological, whatever it may be. But if one third of the population is obese, then you have to look to social structure. And that's where, and this again is something that uh, if, you're, if you're in the learning circle on food, this might be something to look at. Let me tell you what happens. In point of fact, what you get are big companies advertising early on to children, right? I'm going to send you a report. Um, this one is out of the, the United Kingdom, and it shows you in detail what's been happening, how companies market junk food to children online and through television, right? So I'll send you that report. But it, these are the kinds of things you need to look at, right? And part of also what what happens, of course, is that the food industry doesn't want any restrictions on their ability to market to children, right? Or to us, right? And uh, the, the uh, you know, you see it with all the big food companies advertising all the time, even in the supermarkets, what's put at the checkout. So here's mom or dad with a ch child in the trolley and there's all this sweet stuff waiting for them to eat. That's a structural issue, right? So recently, just to, to bring you up to date on this, um, uh, part of what is, uh, according to a University of California team, what's needed are taxes, right? Just like you tax uh, alcohol or tax cigarettes. I think you should even go further than that myself. I think you should ban some of this stuff we don't need it, and it's bad for us, right? Um, you know, the, the official industry body, if you argue, as uh, Professor Robert Lustig has done in a recent uh, uh, journal, Nature, the journal Nature article, um, he's arguing for major shifts, including taxes on sugar. Um, and uh, the industry body, the Food and Drink Federation, said, quote, demonizing food was not helpful. Well, this isn't food, gang. This is really just junk, and people are putting it in their bodies. Maybe some of you, maybe even me. But try to resist, okay? Several countries have already uh, imposed taxes on, on healthy food. Denmark and Hungary have a tax on saturated fat, while France has recently approved a tax on soft drinks, because it's just sugary sweet stuff, nothing you really need, right? And, of course, France and Denmark, the rate of obesity in those countries is about one-third of what it is in the United States. Um, so, uh, you're going to see more and more of this, and if you look at uh, this report that I'll send you from uh, the UK Heart Association, what you, what you find is the subtle ways that food manufacturers promote high-fat, salt, and sugar products to children. Um, cartoon characters, uh, you know, people, personalities, and celebrity whose name or image may be familiar or appeal to children, right? Cartoons, animations, videos, 
The report um, that I'm sending you has examples of all this, okay? Uh, so take a look at it and get familiar with what's really going on because this is going to become a much bigger public issue as people recognize it's not something that only affects uh, individuals. Uh, there's a video that's making its way around um, the uh, internet, the young guy out in California, 23 years old, on Friday, uh, is pleading for help. Right? There will be responses to this, there have been responses to this, because this guy has diabetes already, can hardly move, and he weighs 700 pounds. And for those of you who think in kilo terms, it's um, well over 300 kilograms, okay? 700 pounds. It's a real problem. He's just the most uh, sad example of it, the poor guy. I'm going to also send you a link to the video. It's time we woke up about this kind of stuff. Now, another issue this week has been the extraordinary phenomenon of severe weather, right? Uh, I'm sure many of you know, especially if you are in the United States, that dozens of people were killed in Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, and Alabama, right? Um, entire towns wiped out, uh, absolutely horrible. And what's going on? Well, more and more, you're seeing extreme weather that is tied, without any question, to climate change. Um, over the past six years, for example, violent and deadly weather events have affected more than 240 million Americans, about 80% of that nation's population. Um, and this year alone, you know, this is, what are we, two plus months into 2012, right? Um, in January alone, 70 tornadoes were reported, right? Um, and it, the, the total for January is the third highest since uh, accurate uh, records began in 1950, right? Uh, and what everybody, all the scientists are going to tell you is that there will be more and more severe weather events and that more and more people are going to be affected by it. There's no way to avoid this as temperatures increase. And you know, this brings me finally to the last thing I want to tell you about. A couple of weeks ago, I mentioned Michael Mann, a scientist at uh, Penn State University in the state of Pennsylvania in the United States. Um, he's famous for having produced a graph that shows the uh, increase in temperatures, uh, and his work has been used um, by the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, he's 46 years old, seems a decent guy. He's just bringing out a, uh, um, a book uh, that is titled, uh, let me see, something uh, with the hockey puck. Well, it's the, the, um, the hockey stick uh, graph that got him in trouble, apparently, uh, since he published an article in Nature well over 10 years ago, 1998 to be exact. And he's been attacked. He's received death threats. Even a few days ago, thankfully, the Attorney General of Virginia lost the case. But they tried to subpoena his emails because he'd once worked at the University of Virginia and the Attorney General is one of the people who is a climate denier, right? This is not good, folks. Uh, what's happening is that you're seeing more and more people threatened by the changes that must inevitably come because of climate change and not wanting public policy changes to deal with these public issues, right? They're afraid that the fundamental structures will change, all right? Take a look at what's going on with regard to Michael Mann, and uh, some of you may even want to get his new book, which is called The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars, okay? Uh, please do 
get active in your learning circles. There are lots of issues. And if, you, if somebody wants to email me specifically about a particular topic that you want to explore, please don't hesitate to do so. We want you to become engaged. And if I can help in any way, I'm glad to do that. Okay? <laughs> All the best and, and get in there and go for it. Okay? Thanks a lot. See you next week. Bye-bye.